Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple, the Way of Light. The temple is a place I personally have worked at for the last number of years, so I can really vouch for the the quality and the the profundity of the experience that guests have when they go there. Uh, Predominantly, they're working in the Shipibo tradition, working with ayahuasca and other plant medicines. They offer 12-day retreats, working with... Uh, four different maestros, curanderos, healers, doctors, um, and two to three facilitators, which are kind of like bridges between the the doctors and the guests that come down. There's uh, yoga teachers, uh, plant remedy specialists, bone doctors, massage people, really just uh, an overall amazing support staff. So if you're looking to work with ayahuasca, if you've never worked with it before and it's your first time, or if you have worked it in the past and you're looking to, to go deeper into a, the, the experience, um, the temple is a really amazing place. They've been closed since March of 2020 due to the whole coronavirus pandemic, but they're scheduled to reopen in June of 2021. So if you'd like more information on them, check out their website at templeofthewayoflight.org. Uh, also, myself and my colleague, Marav Artsy, who I interviewed a number of episodes ago, will be running dietas, which is one of the traditional ways that people begin to learn from specific plants here in the Sacred Valley of Peru. Uh, our first one is coming up next month, March 3rd to the 19th, and then the one after that is scheduled May 1st to the 17th. Um, I interviewed Marav, so if you're interested in listening and learning about her, you can look at that episode, and I also did a podcast podcast on dietas and also another one on tobacco. Um, So that's a really good opportunity to go deeper also into this work, learning from plants, by plants, and especially in the tradition that we were trained in, which is working with tobacco, which is a really amazing master plant. So if you'd like more information on that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org. Um, and also Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. All of those links will be in the show notes. So my guest today is uh, Monica Gagliano, and I had heard about Monica a few years ago. There was a, an article published about her, and then more recently, a friend of mine recommended me to her, and she's a really amazing woman. She's uh, originally from Italy, and she's been living in Australia for the last uh, number of years, and she's a scientist. And a lot of her research and work revolves around plants and plant intelligence, uh, which myself and probably many people listening to this podcast are very interested in. Um, and she's a, she's a really fascinating woman because I, I think um, it, it's taken a lot of courage, a lot of dedication, a lot of heart to do, that, to do that work because I think there's been a lot of bias. And as we talk about some... Um, we can only see the world through the lens that we we know. And I think for many people, there was just this view that plants were not intelligent or they were, an in, they were intelligent in a way that we wouldn't say is the same as humans or, or maybe less than humans. But I think a lot of her research has really showed that plants have their own unique intelligence and, and very beautiful intelligence and, and a different type of intelligence. So she's a really fascinating woman. I really enjoy talking to her. She's also done a a lot of work on herself with plants, uh, working with some of these more, you could say, indigenous ways of of working with plants, of looking at the world. And so she's, uh, I think she's a really great ambassador of, of, in a way, bridging these two worlds of this more scientific world, which... Obviously, all of these labels are problematic because, in essence, everything is science. Science is just observation and, and, and coming to conclusions based on our observations. But um, really bridging that language of, of science today with a lot of these more 
uh, traditional or indigenous ways of looking at the world. So um, I think she's, a, again, a, a really interesting person, and I really enjoy talking to her, and I, I think you all will get a lot out of this episode. Uh, she wrote a really good book called Thus Spoke the Plant, so if you're interested in learning more about her work, you can check out her website and also check out her book. So I think that's it. Um, as always, if you're able to help support the show, that's a really big help to me to bring on these interesting guests to continue producing new shows, new episodes. A really good way of doing that is Patreon. There's a link in the show notes. And Patreon is a subscription service where you can um, pledge a certain amount of dollars every month. And in return with that, you get certain things back like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As, things like that. So it's a really nice way to help, to give, to support, and also to receive something back. If you're not able to do that, um, there's also the option of donating via PayPal. There's a link in the show notes of that. And uh, the other thing you can do to really help the show is simply going on the YouTube page, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the videos. Uh, but subscribing is a really big help because that really helps to get the show out to a bigger audience. And then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, also subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a review is also a really big help. So to all of the Patreon supporters, to all the people who have donated, thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. And um, I think that's it. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Monica. Looks like we're recording. All right. Well, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being uh, here with me. Thank you for having me, Jason. So I I heard about you a few years ago. I, I think a, a friend of mine who I work with passed me an article. Um, I forget where it was from. I don't know if it's from the New York Times. It was a fairly major publication about your work, and I, I found it very interesting. And, um, and then I had kind of forgotten about it for a while. And just recently, another friend of mine recommended me, uh, recommended you to me again. And I, I went back and I reread the article and then I reread your book. And, uh, and you sounded like you'd be a perfect guest because really the idea of, of a lot of what I'm doing here is, is trying to bring to light really the, the intelligence of plants, <laughs> which it seems perfectly suited to, to what you do. So um, maybe just to start, um, I'm sure some of the people listening have heard of you and, and I would imagine many haven't. So maybe we could just start by you telling a little bit about yourself, your, your story and, and what you do. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um... I am a research scientist, I guess, and um, I work in Australia. Um, well, I'm based in Australia and much of my work uh, is based here, especially at this time where, uh, when we can't go anywhere else, uh, which has been a kind of uh, relief in a way, unexpectedly, because of course uh, I love traveling and exploring. Uh, but it kind of forced me to refocus. And so a lot of exploration now, it's uh, more localized to this country. And, and I'm very grateful to that because uh, it's changing my research again. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, uh, new, uh, new spaces have opened that probably I would have, always, I, I would have not noticed uh, or paid attention if I was moving so much. So. Uh, I worked, uh, I'm a marine scientist by training, I'm a marine ecologist, and I worked with uh, uh, fish and the marine environment for a long while, and then uh, at one point um, I had my own little ethical crisis about the making and the doing of science as we know it, uh, in terms of Western science, and uh, and so I realized that I needed to change what I was doing, but uh, it, it's not easy and it wasn't easy uh, for me to, to shift. And uh, so I guess I, I received some help 
and the help wasn't coming necessarily from the human world, uh, but the help for me came from, I guess, our most uh, ancient teachers, the plants, and um, and as a marine scientist and an animal ecologist primarily, uh, I uh, like many people. Um, I, I didn't really care about plants. It's like they are in the background and they're just doing whatever they're doing. And, and um, totally plant blind like many. And, uh, but uh, this uh, change of uh, event, this turn of events kind of forced me to like, uh, uh, there's something here that you should be looking at. And, and so thanks to the plants themselves coming into my life to re refocus my science and i i said it before uh, rescuing the scientist in me because um i just assumed that like well if you can't do science in this way the western model then you simply can't do science and uh, so to to be taken by the hand or by the leaf depending <laughs> and uh and be guided towards um, maybe a new way of doing science, which is of course still in total in the making, but um, but a way that is actually kinder and in you know, in in many ways is uh, uh, much deeper and more insightful than uh, the science that I've ever been trained with uh, into and I was doing. So then for the last just over a decade, I've been working with plants, both uh, in my personal life, because I, I now uh, realize that actually I really loved them before, I just didn't know. <laughs> and, um, and I also had to learn how much they loved me and us as humans as well. Okay, so I, um, you know, I've been doing experiments with plants in my lab and, and the experiments um, been from my perspective, have been a co-creation, co co-emergence between these two people, the, the human person that is me and the plant people. And, um, and so in this uh, collaboration, the science that has emerged, um, I guess is a little bit, um, well, many have described it outside the box. To me, it just feels like uh, pretty obvious, but um, I don't think there is anything really extraordinary about the science that I've done, except for the fact that um, the Western model, uh, the, the more traditional way of doing science uh, would not even consider the possibility of asking certain questions. And that's all basically I did. I asked those questions. And, um, and so it's been a very uh, nurturing, challenging, uh, beautiful, horrible journey, <laughs> uh, all of the above. And, uh, but what journey is not all of the above? So if it's a real journey, it should have all of the qualities. And so I'm very grateful for that. And, uh, and then um, I guess uh, I found myself uh, suddenly unemployed and unemployable. Uh, which is, uh, again, ironic because uh, you would think like, well, you know, you did all the science, the science is done, is gone so well, and now how is it possible that you don't have a job? And, uh, but again, um, in hindsight, and even during, after a while, I realized what was going on. And I think uh, the job that I had to do, which eventually materialized into the book, that's for the plant, uh, it was part of my work. It's just that I didn't know that, and um, but the plants did, and uh, and so uh, until the book was finished, there was uh, no. It looked like I was unemployable, and um, and then as soon as I put the full stop, a colleague of mine from Sydney called me up just out of the blue, saying like, "Would you like to do this?" And so I returned to academia. Uh, literally as soon as the book was done. And, uh, and that is where I'm at at the moment. I've been back into academia proper for the last, um, I guess, three years. And um, it's been interesting, uh, but very challenging for me because uh, 
in the process I've changed so much that uh, I know I cannot meet the expectations of the system and yet uh, to be inside the system so that I can maybe uh, offer some uh, inspiration for change it's really difficult so um, my science is changing again and when I get asked like so what do you do is always like oh no uh, which which one of me do you want to talk to because uh, you know I, I I seem to and if I look at the, my entire career I think this is a pattern I seem to resist labels so I don't really even know what to call myself right now <laughs> Uh, I do know that my science is refocusing again uh, and I know that the experiments uh, and the kind of work that I did until like a few years ago, which is I guess some of the work that is more <clears throat> popular in the wider audience, uh, it's done for me and, uh, and I'm moving more into towards my original training in a way, which was an ecological training. So outside, outdoor, in the real world of uh, animals and plants and the earth. And, and in that sense, I'm very excited because uh, I've always been very field-based. And then for the last few years, I was uh, very much in a lab, which is a, a weird thing for me. And then I guess now um, the questions that are arising are uh, subtler, they are very different. They involve, um, the feeling that I have is that they involve bridging different bodies of knowledge. And, and sometimes there is no even a language to, for them to speak to each other yet. And uh, especially when you bring more indigenous perspectives and uh, Western model. And, and so this is the difficulty, I guess, but it's also the challenge. And I always like challenges. So I guess uh, I got the right thing for me <laughs> lined up. And um, but yeah, the focus is, of course, like uh, bridging these different bodies of knowledge uh, so that they can, um, uh, so that a new, maybe a new, or I don't even know how to describe it, but something uh, different can emerge that is not just one or the other, but is uh, literally uh, an emergence out of both. And uh, so that we can move forward together as a humanity and as the planet. And so of course the, the, very, the focus is very much on regeneration, but often we talk about regeneration as environmental regeneration, because of course, especially as an ecological scientist, that's the, seems like the obvious. Uh, oh, we just need to restore everything, you know, we need to repair and uh, but I uh, know and I think this is why it's going to be interesting for me to see where my work is going to go next because uh, it's very clear to me that the real regeneration here is for the human and uh, and then the rest will just follow and uh, and how do we find uh, a good recipe uh, to make this um, this meal, I don't know yet, but it's uh, emerging slowly. So long, long story, I guess, long description for a very simple question. So what do you do? <laughs> but yeah, I guess that's where I'm at. Yeah, beautiful. So one of the things you've you've become known for is, is this idea of, of plan intelligence. And, and I think for many people, they may on some level realize that, that a plant has some intelligence. It, you know, it moves towards the light, it, it takes nutrients from the soil, it, it's giving things, there's something there. But they certainly, most people wouldn't view a plant as having intelligence in the way a human has intelligence or even an animal has intelligence. So what was it, what was it that made you even think <laughs> To, to think differently and to think, hey, this, this, the, these things that, as you said, are surrounding us, we, we live in a world that's full of plants. What kind of sparked that, that even that thought that, that these things might have an intelligence in the way that, that we think of intelligence? 
And then maybe to add on to that, I mean, as you're a scientist, how, how would you define intelligence? And, and maybe, because that may be a, a personal thing, but there's also, there, there's a real definition of, of intelligence, which I found very interesting in your book, very early on in your process, you realized that, that by the, the actual definition of intelligence, plants meet that criteria. That's right. So I guess I'll start from the end and uh, the definition that I apply because it comes just from the, from the etymology of the word itself, so from Latin, uh, it literally means uh, choosing between. So the ability to choose to make decisions and choices between options uh, is something that we see everywhere. I mean, those, no matter what form you are, uh, those who cannot choose and make decisions, basically, they, they do not survive. They cannot survive because the world is offering decision-making opportunities all the time. So this is, life is, um, it is a constant opportunity to choose. And so um, plants in that sense, but not just plants, from bacteria to whatever you can think of, uh, there is always uh, a choice that needs to be made. Well, how these uh, processes uh, are um, embodied and materialized, that it's a different question. And, and I think this is where a lot of the debate is, in, at least in science, although it seems like almost, to me, it seems like a mute point. And in fact, when, when there are, um, there have been some quite aggressive attacks on, um, around these themes and and I just find them like I don't even need to respond because uh, um, you know we are literally talking about quality I'm talking about uh, qualitative differences uh, and while um, there is uh, an intention to quantify them and quantify them uh, in a relative way what I mean by that is like uh, plants can be intelligent in a very plant way. And, uh, and they, in a way, uh, humans are intelligent in a very human way. And to compare them, it seems pretty silly to me because uh, the choices that I need to make, although fundamentally we have to make all the same choices, but the choice that I need to make in every moment are quite different from the choices that plant is making any morning. And the plant is not judging me for not making the same choices that the plant makes. So why have I got the right as the human to judge them for making different choices? So in that sense, uh, quantifying again in, a, in these relative ways, I think is a waste of time. But um, you know, it's part of the foundation of modern science, which is still unfortunately based on a very anthropocentric uh, perspective, which means that we as the human are the reference point uh, and by being the, the golden standard, that's why what everything is measured against. There is this uh, oppositional uh, position. <laughs> and uh, while I'm trying to say, I don't want to be courting those uh, polarities, I, I, I want to just explore how different uh, beings express themselves and just uh, cherish that. How amazing that not everything is, is expressing itself in a, in a human way. Why, how boring would that be? If everything is just looking like us and expressing like us, it's like, oh my God. I mean, the reason why we love, I have a dog and, and anybody that has a dog or a pet of any kind, the reason why I love my dog for, for out of many other reasons is also because he's got this wonderful tail that he just speaks so loudly whenever he's happy, when he's not happy, when he's intensely like focusing on something. I mean, I'm not um, jealous of my dog because he's, uh, he's got a tail that is so expressive. I'm not trying to become a dog and, and certainly I'm not expecting him to stop using your tail because uh, you need to be more like me. Uh, so of course this comparison looks absolutely silly, but this is basically what we do when we are expecting something else, someone else uh, to behave and conform to our own yeah, expectations and our own assumption of what the right way to do thing is. So 
so for me, intelligence, uh, when, uh, like, if you ask the scientists, the intel in me, the intelligence uh, concept would be about how are choices made, how are uh, decision making, how is decision making expressed but in different forms, and and for this we, I guess, have so much to learn because we know so little about many of the organisms that uh, we have excluded because they, according to our uh, limitations, uh, they don't have a brain, therefore automatically they will not be able to make any of those uh, uh, behaviors uh, in terms of decision making. While, and, and they represent the majority. <laughs> They is not just the plants, but there are all sorts of creatures and they represent the majority of organisms on the planet. So basically we are excluding the majority of the world um, from this uh, idea that they, are, they have an intelligence. So of course, suddenly when you say, I know, I think that some of them do, actually, I think all of them do, uh, you can see how that will be quite disturbing to the elite, which is us. Uh, to be destabilized from our pedestal, I guess. So like, oh, but I thought we were special. <laughs> then we are special. Human intelligence is very special. Plant intelligence is very special too. And all of the intelligences are very special, equally special. <laughs> so um, the, then to go to your initial question really, which is probably the more interesting to me. Um, you know, you asked, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but you asked how did I come to think about plant could be intelligent? And, uh, and I guess the answer is very simple. I didn't think. <laughs> it's not something that I needed to think. It's something that I needed to experience and feel. And this is, a, again, a very different way of, um, as the scientist, again, is a very different way of approaching. So uh, as the scientist, I'm expected to be objective and to think through the problem. And uh, while uh, myself as the personal uh, being that is exploring, which might be also called a scientist, um, the feeling and the experience is really what inspires whatever else I uh, imagine the world to be. And, uh, so it was from direct experience with my plants in my garden to start with, and then uh, in connection and in uh, relation with plants and, um, and keepers of plants, very special plants that are, you know, where you are right now, like uh, in the Amazon and in different parts of the world where uh, some plants are known and well regarded as uh, incredible teachers. Um, so I guess over time, I have come to realize that all plants actually are incredible teachers. And so even within that context of uh, some plants are special, uh, all of them are special. And uh, I've been taught by a blade of grass as well as the, you know, the mighty ayahuasca. So I think it really, I think that the bottom line is that what they are trying to teach us is um, relationship. Through relationship, everything becomes special and everything is uh, possible. So uh, I didn't have to think about plants being intelligent. I was humbled by their intelligence. And then I had to make you know, peace with that and, and find the new terms to express myself in the context of the human, but also in the context of the scientists. And I guess they're still work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot there. You, you mentioned this idea. I mean, it seems almost natural in a way that, that humans, we, we almost have to look at things through an anthropocentric point of view because that's, that's the lens that we're looking at the world. And, um, you know, you mentioned this idea of etymology, which I, I've really come to love, the, 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 the nature and the meaning of words. And it seems maybe a lot of that is coming from this just place of ignorance and, and not ignorance in a way of like demeaning someone, but in the true sense of the word, which simply means, I think in Latin, ignorare, which means to not know. And we, we can't know what we don't know. <laughs> and, and unless, and, and I think... It's a really interesting point you made, this idea of, of, of a feeling, of a sense that's beyond the mind. And 
And a lot of what we're speaking about with intelligence, I think we often think that it comes from the mind, but there's something beyond that too. And so it becomes very hard to maybe even define these things or rationalize them. And unless someone has had an experience of working with the plant or having some sort of connection, it's very difficult to, to talk about that or even to imagine that. Um, mm -hmm. So do you think that's perhaps, you know, because I, I, I know I can imagine, and I think I, I, I remember reading in your book, you know, I imagine a lot of your journey must have been very difficult because anytime, you know, if we're coming from a scientific background and we're speaking about something that there really seems to rock the foundation of what we're speaking about, there's always going to be criticism. I, I can't remember who it was, maybe Buckminster Fuller said, you know, all truth passes through three stages. The first is it's ridiculed <laughs> or it's laughed at. The second is it's violently opposed. And the third, uh, you know, a long time later, is ex it's, it, it's accepted as if it was truth all along. <laughs> and I think so much of science actually goes through that. You know, at first it's laughed at, it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed. But then, then down the line, we just accept it as if we always thought that way. <laughs> That's right. And I guess uh, the lesson for me in that, uh, so my science, um, both my plant learning and memory and my plant communication work with the sound, um, both have been through the first stage <laughs> of uh, being laughed at. And then um, both of them have been through the second stage of like violently and aggressive attacks. Um, one, the acoustic and the communication part, which is, I guess, a little bit more palatable because we already knew that plants could communicate in various ways. And then it was just a matter of like, oh, and they also use sound, you know? It was like, oh, there is also this other thing. And uh, so that has already reached stage number three. And, uh, and so people in other places are doing experiments. And in fact, not only that, but uh, there are a few uh, new pieces of work where my work has not even been acknowledged. Mm. And, uh, and the work is being presented as like, oh, and we are doing this brand new thing. And of course, uh, that is actually very unprofessional from a scientific perspective. But for me, it's like, uh, oh, wow. So we have reached the point where someone can actually publish a piece like this without re receiving any resistance and, uh, and without even acknowledging where the background was like where the foundation had been laid, but, but how good that we, can, we got to the point where the entire controversy can be totally ignored, it's not even relevant anymore. And uh, so this is the, you know, strange twist, I guess, is, uh, is a very great compliment to my work. That's how I take it because, uh, because ultimately, and I've said this all the time and I, and I stay by, like I, I am standing with this still now, is I, the ultimate goal of my work, all of my work, including the one I haven't done yet, is to become so totally um, irrelevant in the sense that it's been so totally incorporated, digested, it has become part of the normal world as we see it, that it, there is nothing to say. Actually, it's more like, uh, oh, what is the big deal? So when my work gets to that stage, and for the plant acoustic now, I think that we have been, we have reached that. Uh, and the behavior um, in terms of learning and intelligence and memory is uh, moving along slower because it's a bigger deal, I guess. But uh, I know many colleagues and um, who have been, you know, experimenting and doing, asking those questions. So we are moving towards the third phase now. And so, yeah, I guess um, what you describe is exactly what um, science the process of science and the process of uh, knowledge creation as we as we make it right now uh, it's um it, fo it follows that pattern and it's yeah it's quite correct the question really for me and this is part of what um 
I'm interested at the moment and I'm working on is about uh, what you just started with actually with ignorance and um, in the sense of like the not knowing and uh, and now to use uh, uh, this not knowing uh, as part of the science that we do. So often the science is built on uh, knowledge <laughs> and, uh, and it's built on the fact that uh, you kind of are designing an experiment knowing uh, that uh, there are certain expectations of what you might find. But to be able to do a science that uh, opens to no expectations and, uh, and it allows for the subjective interaction. So the intersubjectivity in this case for me will be me and my plant to, uh, to dictate basically and to shape and to allow for whatever needs to emerge to emerge uh, and, and do that science. I think that it's um, again my next uh, venture. Uh, I have been um, with with the help of a really beautiful ethnographer, uh, anthropologist. I have been, um, you know, we've been working on one particular piece at the moment, and uh, and we have sent it out for review to see how, you know, to test the water, see how it would be received, and. Um, and it was amazing. It's like, uh, I think they sent it to an anthropologist at, uh, one, at some point and, and the anthropologist had no problem. And he totally, or she totally understood where we were coming from and why the subjectivity, the, uh, the intersubjectivity, the relationship between the two parties and not just the two parties, but all of the components that make that moment uh, were important to take into account in the making of this uh, science. And then, uh, and on the other side, I think they sent it to a more traditional scientist and uh, maybe a neuroscientist or a cognitive scientist. And the answer was like, uh, I don't understand. You know, like if you, if you don't know what you're doing and, you know, and in a way the, the experiment was a failure because the experiment, uh, we were trying to demonstrate how doing things in a particular way with the knowing of it might actually hinder what it is that to be known. So the not knowing is part of the deal that we need to engage with. And, uh, but of course the, the scientist was just like, I don't understand where, where are the data and what are you trying to say? <laughs> And uh, the not knowing is so uncomfortable. And the fact that uh, the, these um, epistemic feelings, that's how we call them, like these feelings in the way in which we learn about, uh, we approach uh, nature in the world around us to, to know it. Uh, yeah, there, there is, um, it's almost like the science can acknowledge that there is a space for them, but we use them all the time. We use them all the time because we're humans and humans are feeling critters and, and we are inevitably doing this, but then somehow we remove it from the picture and pretend that we've been objective all along. <laughs> well, our objectivity is completely ridiculous because we are subjects, we are not objects. So, and we are watching and looking and interacting with other subjects, not objects. So how can there be an objective science in the first place? But, you know, working on this <laughs> and um, yeah, working on it. And I think that the not knowing from a more or personal perspective, which of course has informed then my science as well, is been, I think it's, I, I had to learn how that was actually where the power was of my work. Uh, the idea that I am, uh, I can be prepared to uh, yeah, surrender to this unknown territory, uh, that the more I try to know it uh, by thinking about it, the less it, it's available. And yet when I back off and I try to not know it <laughs> and just feel it, uh, it, it becomes obvious. And uh, I suppose that anybody who has worked with plants, uh, especially like um, in terms of medicinal plants, uh, both as literally um, uh, herbalists, as well as uh, uh, people who, uh, you know, indigenous people who work with these plants, uh, for healing purposes is like the um, 
often it's not the chemical composition of the plant that is going to do the job. Like this is how our Western paradigm is translating a lot of these experiences in this work. And it becomes all about the, the chemicals and how much. And, but actually, you know, no, the work is being done by the, the, the meeting of these two beings. And one is a plant being. And the other one is the human. And the plants have worked out a lot of things ahead of us. <laughs> They've been around for a long time. And they, they, you know, as I said at the beginning, they are our most ancient teachers. So it's not surprise that they would know how to fix our bodies when we are like, oh, I'm, I'm so here or I, I don't feel good. And, uh, and I'm not talking about just the physical not good, but also the emotional and spiritual not good. So yeah, they're like grandmas, you know, <laughs> like and grandpas looking at us like, yeah, I've seen this before. Come and I'll fix you up. You need this. And, um, and then of course, if we were to really appreciate them in that way, you know, how different would be our society in general, our approach to, to life in general, very different, mm -hmm. very different. Yeah, you, you mentioned this idea, <clears throat> you know, so much of, of, of how we look at the world is through this lens, which, which we often call the Western mind. And, and I think, you know, it's also to some degree labeling creates difficulty too, because probably most of the world now looks at the world that way through that same lens. So it, it doesn't even have so much to do with where you're from or what your roots are. But and you also mentioned this idea of indigenous and, and again, a similar thing. I mean, you know, we all were indigenous at some point. We all came from these roots that have these very strong traditions, which I think the more anyone looks into it, we can see that they, they, they had a thread that was common all over the world. So I, I, I'd be curious, and, and I'd love to talk more about your work, um, but I'd be really curious because you did spend time in these more kind of not just indigenous communities, but but an indigenous way of looking at the world that was very influenced by working with plants and working with plants, as you said, as a teacher, that, that this thing that actually has the ability to teach us, which I, you know, many people listening to the show, that doesn't sound crazy, but to some people listening to this show, that's going to sound crazy. So would you be able to maybe talk a little bit about your experience of, of working and, and learning through almost just a very different lens of, of and, and, mm -hmm. and what that kind of taught and showed you? Yeah, well, I, I might share something that has happened very recently and, uh, and then I'll uh, back step. <laughs> uh, so um, two weeks ago, I found myself um, being taken in emergency at the hospital. And, uh, and within 24 hours, I had emergency surgery. And, um, and it's been interesting because uh, um, the last time that, that I have been in a medical setting of that kind, I was, uh, you know, it was 40 years ago. <laughs> so it's just like, uh, I don't know hospitals. I don't know those environments. I, I don't go to the doctor. And uh, so I don't know what it means to be sick. And I don't know what it means to, to be in that space where sickness is dealt in a particular way and, um, and it's seen as a, something that needs to be fixed. Now, of course, uh, mine was an emergency situation and um, uh, I wasn't gonna be stupid to say like, oh, we have the perfect tool to deal with this and say, oh, no, 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 thank you. <laughs> uh, I feel again that we have so many tools and whether they're coming from like modern medicine or indigenous approaches or herbalism or whatever it is, like we use, we need to know and learn how to use the appropriate tool for the appropriate situation. But even within that context, for example, I, um, I was given, because uh, there was a lot of pain, I was given morphine and uh, I never taken morphine before and uh, it didn't do anything for my pain, but it made me feel really weird. <laughs> and um, then I came home and I'm literally, I'm currently in recovery. <laughs> and, uh, and I find myself feeling very uh, unstable. Like internally, I just felt, aside from the, oh, I've got scars and you know, I had an operation, but I just felt very unstable to the point that there was a lot of anger 
and a lot of um, sense of being worthless, sense of like, uh, I don't have a purpose. And, uh, and I was talking to a friend, a really dear friend of mine, so like, oh, you know, I, I'm so angry and I don't even know why. And I just feel like I, I, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And uh, uh, which is actually like, I question what I'm doing with my life a lot normally, but this one was, uh, was a bit different. It, there was a taste of, um, yeah, feeling hopeless and worthless, which wasn't very nice. And, uh, and I said to him, I found myself saying to him like, do you know, I think what I need is, uh, is uh, an elder, someone that can tell me what to do. And, uh, and he said to me like, well, first of all, let me tell you, because he knows me really well. So like, you wouldn't last five minutes with someone telling you what to do, <laughs> no matter who that person was. And second, why are you thinking that an elder should know what you need? Beside, uh, maybe instead of using the word elder, which of course has a connotation of uh, someone that is supposed to be wise and supposed to know better than you and is older, generally speaking. And, uh, but it's, uh, instead of uh, thinking of it as an elder, which naturally goes towards uh, another human person, uh, why don't you think of it as uh, the wise ones? And then you, you of all people are surrounded always by them. So even now you don't need to look for anyone because they are right around you. And um, so in that moment, I'm sharing this because in that moment he allowed me to realize that I was, uh, whether it, it felt to me, whether it was the morphine or not, it felt to me that, that the entire episode at the hospital, although it was very brief, was quite, I guess, traumatic for the body and my, my spirit. And, and when I came out, I was left with this uh, rapture, this disruption and uh, this break. And in that break, uh, I felt separate and I felt disjointed by, from what uh, sustained me and what gives me joy and what it makes me feel normally like, uh, even when things are not maybe going great, but it's like, I always have this feeling of feeling supported. And the things, even if they don't look fine, they're actually good fundamentally. And so that was missing and, and him reminding me like, uh, you don't need to look, they're already there. They've always been there. You know this, you actually know this. Uh, gave me this insight that of course allowed me to bring myself back into center again. And so I went out and planted slowly because I'm supposed to go slow, but I went out and planted like four or five plants in my garden and, uh, and it felt really good and I'm watching them grow and it feels really good. And I'm like very grateful that they are here, but, uh, but also it reminded me how, um, yeah, how easy it is to feel out of center. And if you are in that place and there is no one around you that actually reminds you they're like, hey, no, look, you know, this is, you're looking through a lens that actually doesn't allow you to look properly and look, you know, what really hits here. And, um, and yeah, it reminded me how devastating that is. And how I saw it in my interaction with people who love me very much around me and to whom I wasn't able to be kind at all because I was in my own little pain, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, if you take this as a, as a mi micro version of uh, what happened in, in the wider world, I think humanity uh, most often has been in a space like I have been recently, where it's like, uh, you know, we feel hopeless, uh, we don't know what our purpose is, and we are angry. So we just start bashing around, uh, not only in the relationship with other humans, but also around anything that comes that it can be a good target. And um, so I guess um, in that sense, the experience with, um, uh, with the plants and in particular, the way in which other uh, part of humanity uh, can interact and maintain this center is um, yeah, allowed me to come back, come back home uh, a little quicker. You know, I dwelled a little bit in my little anger and stuff and then now it was like, yeah, okay, I need to get back home. And, uh, and that's exactly 
the the word that I use when I said to my friend, like, I just feel I'm so far away from home. And, um, and the returning home is possible. It's just, uh, it's exactly just a change of perspective. And then it's very obvious. And once you're there, uh, even if you might go away for a while, it's easy to come back home all the time because you know where home is. And, and I suppose that this is probably the, the biggest um, learning or teaching that I received. Uh, you know, I, I had so many beautiful experiences and there have been so many beautiful insights uh, from different plants in different contexts. But ultimately, it's like they just showed me where home is. And um, and that is a place that is the place where we all live in and we all come from and we all go to uh, eventually. So um, we never actually left. It's just that there is this perception that we are not at home, and it's just a, a, a yeah a filter, a misperception. So. Yeah, the experiences with uh, in various uh, indigenous contexts have just reminded me how, as humans, uh, we are naturally uh, at home. We are naturally designed to sit there in that space, and it actually feels very quite unnatural when we are not. And but we have normalized that unnatural position. And, uh, and now we are talking about the indigenous uh, perspective as if it's something weird and special, you know, a bit archaic from some perspective and, and, uh, and who, who would need that? And, uh, and yet we don't understand like, uh, thanks God, there is still a component of our humanity that is remembering exactly where, when and how to be at home. And uh, despite all of the anger and tantrum and disaster, uh, that the other rest of us has, uh, has created uh, in our moment of anger. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there is a component of humanity that still remembers and is holding, holding that space for everyone else. And uh, so in that sense, you know, the respect for the indigeneity, um, I totally agree with you is that we are all indigenous. Where else can, where else did we come from? If not all from here. So. But the, the, that is aspect of indigeneity that is in all of us is actually embodied by some indigenous people who are actually still living by those principles of indigeneity right now. And in that sense, I really respect that because their job has been so hard and so difficult and, uh, and to stand despite everything and to know what home is and to hold that not just the memory, but the embodiment so that we can all go home. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not a small job. <laughs> so I am, I'm very grateful anytime that I have an opportunity to interface and somehow do my little part to bring that perspective more into, yeah, into what we call the mainstream, which is just a stream that is going to be derailed, <laughs> but um, ultimately it's going to the ocean anyway. So, <laughs> do you do you think those experiences you had with 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 some of these plants? Do you think they they helped to to guide you uh, with with the work you're doing? That there was that there was something that in that experience it, it showed you something that. That kind of gave you insight into maybe seeing the world in a different way that helped to guide you in, in, in the direction you're moving in now? Yeah, definitely. And, and not, on, not just that, because I don't want to romanticize. A lot of this work was about dismembering, <laughs> literally being pulled apart, be, uh, uh, yeah, devoured by all of the ideas and all of the conditioning that I had that uh, I attached myself so strongly to. And uh, so it's not like, oh yeah, these are, all these experiences are wonderful and like they're so beautiful, like they are, but in a very different way that what we are imagining. They're not like, they're not, they don't all come in pink. Some come in dark browns and blacks, and uh, and um, 
and yet to embrace you know those aspects and then to realize that actually that's also just another perspective and it's okay and and I'm I'm all of these and also none of these and that the plants and the experiences especially uh, within with this uh, indigenous plant with plants in indigenous context um yeah they're very powerful because um because they literally undo some they have done, undone something inside me and then there is space for for something else to emerge and uh, the risk of course that you're trying to change or you think you're going to change and you are, you're going to change exactly in the same that you were. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why this work is so important because uh, you can't think it. You need to, it's the experience and the experience can be beautiful, traumatic, but ultimately is trying to deliver you home. So if, if you think of it, you won't, you won't be going anywhere. And, uh, but only once that uh, process of uh, undoing is, uh, is done, that then I think you can really uh, start bringing the self, the, the, the emerging self into the picture. And that emerging self could be doing something very different uh, from what it was. And so in my case, the science that came out was, um, yeah, I, I think, I think I let go a lot of the, you know, my expectation for a career, my expectation of what my colleagues will think about me, my expectation of like, you know, what are all the expectations that there are in academia, but I guess in all jobs, you know, and just uh, realizing that why are you actually doing this work? Are you doing it for you? like uh, as just your own selfish motive, then um, yeah, good luck. <laughs> but if you're actually doing it in service of something else, then be selfless in the sense like uh, put those expectations away because they're not about you. And, and even if this work means that you're gonna lose your career, are you prepared for that? And, uh, and of course I needed to experience that too, to know that like, uh, I wasn't actually prepared for that. And then I, through that, I learned that I was <laughs> another dismembering. And only through those experiences of undoing that, yeah, the work that came out could come out, if it makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can imagine, you know, as you said, a, a lot of that work is a process of, of, of letting go, of, of dismembering, as you said. and. And I would imagine in that there, you know, I think everyone experiences these insights and, and you know, direction and the, these rays of hopes and guidance. But then I would also imagine kind of as you were speaking about at the beginning, once we begin to go down one of those threads, we also realize that maybe that's not even what it was pointing towards. And, and there's actually even something much deeper behind that. And then we're almost left in a state of confusion. Like, where do I go from here? And, and you know, what is the bigger picture? And, and so I'd be curious you know, maybe if, if you feel like talking about your work in the past, but, but also now what's moving, you know, what's moving you forward too? And, and you know, how you find yourself in this, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure not, you know, I think, you know, many people, uh, I mean, you know, from my work with these plants, I, I think one of the, the most common things people come to is, they feel lost in some sense. And, and the, as you said, they're, they're looking to come home. I think that's what everyone is looking for. And, but obviously we can't just, you know, sit under a tree all day. Like we, we have to do something. We have to put that into action. So yeah, I would just be curious what, you know, what maybe, maybe some of the work you've done and then how that's shifting and then transforming into, to, if you have any idea where that's <laughs> where that's moving you towards. <laughs> yeah, well, um, no, I don't really have an idea where it's moving me, but that's part of the deal. And I think um, the key word for me is uh, two words actually, which kind of point to the same state. And, um, and they were both, um, 
yeah, they, they were given over and over again by different plants over and over again. And the two words for me are uh, on one side is unconcerned and on the other side is trust. And of course, you can only trust if you're unconcerned and if you trust, you can be very unconcerned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what it really means is like, uh, you know, like we can do as much as we like in terms of working with these plants and learning from these plants. And as you said, receiving lots of beautiful insights and having beautiful experiences. But ultimately, unless we apply it in the context of our trivial life of every day, you know, and we bring those insights into action, then we're just having a nice experience. And in a way, it's a very escapist uh, approach, you know. So yeah, we can't sit under a tree all day, but what we're doing is that we're sitting in ceremony and thinking that we are going to better ourselves and then just go back and do the same over and over again. So if we are not actually applying what we've been taught is like going to school and never learn anything, you know, repeating class one over and over again because you're not actually applying what you learned. So, and yeah, and the plants seems to, for me, the, the, the pattern that I've noticed is that uh, whenever I receive an insight or uh, some guidance, especially at times when I find like a feeling a little like, whoa, I don't know what's happening, or there are very intense moments of uh, confusion and uh, challenge. Um, yeah, this idea of being unconcerned, it just reminds me like, uh, just remember that we are giving you all of these uh, challenges and these experiences so that you can practice. <laughs> Practice being unconcerned. It's very, it's very easy to be unconcerned and to trust when things are going so smoothly. But actually, it's when things are not so smooth and the things are challenging, that is like, hmm, can you trust now? Can you be unconcerned now? And so, of course, uh, this has translated into my work as well. And more recently, last year, I had a beautiful uh, field trip in here in Australia with some elders and a group of scientists and we went to this beautiful site that really feels like is uh, asking for more work to be done there more work i mean more relating and for more understanding and sharing to occur and uh and of course like uh, my mind my scientific mind is like oh we could i can see what we could do you know <laughs> And, uh, but, um, but I also know from also previous experience that in this context, there is no way I can push and, and uh, speed up things. Things are gonna happen when they're ready to happen. So to trust that I, I know that I'm supposed to be involved in this space and I know I can feel it that it's like, yeah, this is, a, this is gonna be an important project. You're gonna learn a lot here and Hopefully, in the process, I will also be able to offer a lot. But, um, but I need to trust that it will happen in its own time, which might not coincide with the timing that I'm expected to operate at as uh, you know, the academic. But again, then the, the question comes and is like, are you concerned about that? Because if you're concerned about what the expectation is for your work, like from, say, you know, for my um, performance report at the end of the year, then you're gonna end up doing things not for what they need to be done, for the reason, the right reason that they need to occur, but for some other agenda of yours. But that's not your service. So can you be unconcerned about the fact that you, you might not meet those criteria, that things might not happen in the way in which they are expected to happen according to whatever. And instead they will happen perfectly and beautifully when it's the right time. And um, yeah, so I'm applying these two concepts right now <laughs> because of course I'm ready to go right now and do my project and like be you know, involved straight away. But funny enough, I ended up in hospital instead. And then, you know, as I'm recovering and I'm like, okay, soon I'll be ready. Uh, I receive a message from uh, a colleague 
uh, and one of the elders I was supposed to be connecting with to do this kind of work, uh, she also is going to for emergency surgery this week. So it's like, uh, what's going on? Again, I can see that for me, even while I was through emergency, there was something that I needed to let go of because literally they had to remove some tissue. And so they literally had to free up something, remove something that I don't need anymore. And he almost feels like, oh, wow, maybe the elder is having to do the same process so that by the time that we come together, we are really ready and we are encumbered by the past or at least some of the past that is obviously, it's not possible to go ahead with that right now. And so again, trusting that this is all just perfectly, there is no other way that it could be. It's just perfectly as it is. And, uh, and feeling unconcerned by, yeah, what that really means, the delay, is it really a delay? Or maybe, you know, it's just simply not the right time. And then when it is the right time, it's gonna be really perfect. And even like in a practical way of maybe, you know, going in the field right now, it could be, there could be a flood or there could be a major fire and that's it, you know? But in a few months when we might be ready, it would be the perfect season the perfect time of the year to be in, 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 in con on country and to be doing the work that we will need to do, which we still don't know exactly what it is, but is waiting for us to meet for it to emerge. So uh, this is how I move through my work now. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So do you do you see yourself continuing to to work in the field of, of plant intelligence or is it deepening to something bigger, uh, you know, the, the world at large, um, uh, you know, because even this idea of intelligence, it obviously we can look at it from the perspective of plants, but then that that begs larger questions, too. So is that something that, that also interests you? Yeah. And in fact, the project that I'm mentioning, uh, the the idea would be to, um, there are obviously plenty of plants involved, <laughs> but also, um, you know, there is the, the land itself, the, the soil, the country uh, who has a story to tell. There are other critters, animals that live there. Uh, there is also, there are also other agents, other people in this scene. And uh, one for this particular landscape is fire. And of course, on the other side, you go rain. So water and fire are not minor elements. They, they shape and create and allow for the emergence to, to, of certain systems and certain landscapes. So yeah, learning to um, enter in conversation with those as well and um, and I, uh, I don't have much experience or hardly any experience with fire, for example, but I know from what I've heard and learned from other people that, you know, fire has got its own personality and it's, uh, it's got its own intelligence. And uh, if we think that plants, plant intelligence is such an alien thing to us, well, <laughs> Start talking about fire or rocks or water intelligence. But then again, this is not a new concept. Like it's a new concept for the Western mind, but it's not a new concept for the mind of the humans that we were and we still are. And I think the same way as um, the work with the plants specifically, one of the main comments that, or the most common comments that I receive from people uh, from around the world, you know, writing me, writing to me and say like, oh, thank you so much for your work. Uh, I, I, I always knew that. And finally, I can just, you know, I feel like science is uh, validating me. And, uh, and it's almost like, well, first of all, you never needed science to validate you. But in a way, maybe yes, that's what we, our, our Western mind needed to hear. So that now it's okay for, for, for anybody to say like, yeah, you know, plants are intelligent, not a big deal. So then I guess to move from there to like, yeah, but not just plants. And, uh, and 
invite in the picture all of these other characters. I think that that's pretty much where my um, work is, at least for where I can see from where I stand now. This is where it feels like my work is going to go to. And so plants, of course, are a major character in my life, but um, and they will remain. I am, you know, in conversation with them all the time and um, willingly or unwillingly, <laughs> of course. And, uh, and I engage with them all the time, you know, ceremonially and in many ways. So they are definitely, a, a, like, they are definitely a, a big um, teacher for me. But, um, but I guess, yeah, it would defeat the purpose. And I think the plant would agree. <laughs> It would defeat the purpose if we were to just stop there and draw yet another line. It would be just the same as the line that we did, we did draw in the sand to say that the human was different from everything else. So now we're saying the human, the animals, and the other animals and the plants are different from everything else. And instead, I think that we are trying to remove the line altogether and just realize that ultimately there is no difference. Just the only difference is the diversity of forms that take shape, but that's about it. So, I mean, we are all fire as well, and we are all water as well. So where does our intelligence come from? Of course, if we think that we are intelligent because we have a brain, then that might be game over already. But then if we look at what the brain is made of, fire, and water, some earth, and a little bit of air. <laughs> so ultimately, yeah, we are made of pretty much nothing. So to 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 bring to bring to that, and then, but not in a uh, annihilating way, but in a way that actually uh, gives this sense of awe of how this nothingness can become so many things, so many forms. That is pretty spectacular. And um, yeah, and in that sense, of course, you know, the we are all related becomes uh, something of being unconcerned because it's such an obvious thing. Now we have to say it, we have to remind ourselves because we actually don't really believe it. We don't really know it. But once you know it, you don't need to say it anymore. It's the same like, you know, often, People, especially when they start in a more, you know, engaging with their own spirituality, I often find them like, you know, they are very attached to the stone or whatever thing that they put on their altar, which is beautiful. And I do have my altar and I still have that. But my altar has become simpler and simpler over time. And, uh, and I know that I don't need to give so much significance to the symbol of it because actually I'm my, you know, I'm surrounded, I'm sitting on the altar <laughs> and I'm surrounded by the altar all the time. And so basically it's to move from that more defined and more, um, yeah, more symbolic way of approaching to in a way, a more grounded and embodied way of approaching this reality. And, uh, and again, in my experience, at least, especially actually in the jungle, um, but not only, I think I could generalize this to the people that I have met up around the world. You know, often these uh, elders, curanderas, healers, whatever we want to call them, whatever they are, um, they are very no-nonsense no people, very grounded. There is no bullshit around. There is no like, ooh, and now. It's like, there is none of that stuff. It's like, uh, no, that, well, this is what you need. Off you go, you do it like this and this, and off you go, and then come back and let's move on. <laughs> and uh, so they don't, to me, they, I don't feel they need to put a special stone on the altar to know the things that they know. And they have embodied it so much that they can just be that all the time. And um, that's why, again, I'm very grateful that they are still with us because uh, they are just, again, a reminder that this is where we're going. This is, uh, this is they represent the, the, the human, the full-fledged human. 
and I'm not trying to romanticize them because I know that in indigenous community there is plenty of trouble as well. So the indigeneity is not about whether you are, you know, your skin is of a certain color or your eyes of a certain shape. Is literally the the way in which you are embodying this life, and um, yeah. Yeah, beautiful, Sorry. beautiful. <laughs> Going like well, blah, I, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's amazing. So I'm actually really curious. So I, I think, so if anyone is interested in your research on, on plant intelligence, they, they can find that in Thus Spoke the Plant. You, you do a really beautiful job of explaining that. I'm actually curious if you can talk about it, what would be the, the methodology that you begin to look at this, this idea of fire and rock? Because again, that's, mm -hmm. that's I, I think for the, the human mind, <laughs> again, we, we all accept that we're intelligent. We accept to some degree that maybe our dog or our cat is intelligence. To a lesser degree, we accept that, okay, maybe, maybe now, yes, plants are also intelligent. <laughs> But most people, when they think about fire or a rock, I think for most people, that's where it stops. <laughs> it's like, no, come on, that's too much. <laughs> but again, you know, from, from a, a point of view of all over the world, you know, even these ideas that, that most of us have, that, you know, most people probably to some degree still believe in, in something like God or, or, or oneness. And it, if that's embodied in all things, then that essence of God is in all things. So how, how could anything right. not be intelligent? But from, from your methodology, from, from a scientific point of view, which I think is so important because people, for better or for worse, we need to hear it from that lens. So do you have any idea of the methodology you may be going about to, to try and bring that to, to fire or, or rocks? Uh, I think this is uh, my next challenge, but um, but one thing that I can say is like uh, I wasn't present for this. A friend of mine described it to me, and uh, uh, she was uh, at this uh, cultural burning, and uh, and the elders were like, "Okay, we're gonna burn uh, tomorrow, and we're gonna burn here," and so the next day off they go and they do this burning. And I think it was, uh, the, the, I don't know, I, I think the condition to the Western person seemed like really like, oh my God, they're not going to burn under this condition. I mean, there maybe there may was some wind or something that just felt like it feels dangerous. And, uh, and the other was like completely unfazed and, you know, they lit the fire. And before that, it just said like, the fire will go from here to there, to this point over here, then it will turn around and then it will do this and this, and then it will stop. And so lit the fire, and of course this huge flame started. And uh, from the Western perspective, it was like, oh my God, oh maybe they got it wrong. Maybe the, this is gonna be a disaster. You know, like uh, there's no way this fire and this uh, and fear, fear because of ignorance, not understanding fire. And uh, the fire actually uh, blasted around and did exactly what the elder said he would do. So he went over there, da, 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 and then he turned around, and then he stopped, and he turned off. And the elder just looked like, you know, my friend was like, uh, how did you know? And the elder just, like, he didn't even acknowledge. It was just like, uh, you don't know fire, that's why. You haven't engaged, and you haven't built a relationship with fire. That's why you can't understand how I would know. But which would be the same that you could say, like, uh, what do you mean plants are intelligent? Like, well, if you have experienced plants and you have connected with plants, this will feel like, a, but of course they are. Where have you been? <laughs> but if you haven't, that can seem like such a weird, strange, kind of crazy even concept. And uh, so until these ideas remains concept, then it's very difficult for our mind, I think, to get around it. And it's not for the mind to get around it anyway through experiences, I think that we can then make our own decision of like, wow, okay, so yeah, I had this experience with plant, or I had this experience with fire, or I had this experience with X, whatever. And uh, yeah, my own experience is teaching me that, yeah, there is a relationship here that I can build. And, and the more relationship you build, the more you realize that you are in relationship with everything. And then that idea of oneness that uh, especially in the, you know, 
Western New Age model, it's very just smeared around everywhere. So, but yeah, it's not a fluffy thing. It's like, um, it needs to be grounded. Often, you know, these movements are not grounded at all. So it needs to be grounded, it needs to be embodied and it needs to be put in action. So if you're really, and if you're really understanding that then behave accordingly. And yet we're not. So it just, in our action, we just reveal where we are. And, and I think our action tell a long story about what we are not yet arrived. And uh, including myself, don't, you know, I'm not just, so yeah, process of learning. And uh, I'm, I am kind of looking forward to, to learn and to be introduced uh, into this new relationship with fires and with rocks and water and whatever else. And, um, you know, I was a marine scientist for a long time and spent a lot of time underwater. And, uh, and yet, um, and with water in particular, there is this strange, uh, you know, love affair of uh, loved deeply and yet, you know, kind of afraid as well. And because I have been held down by big waves, I have been, you know, being called almost to death, you know, they, they are, but that I think is good because it's part of the relationship is like, uh, look, I, if we are in good terms, we will be honoring and respecting each other, but otherwise I can be destructive and you too. <laughs> and, uh, and fire is a similar, it, it feels similar as like fire can be so regenerative and especially in a landscape like Australia, some plants require fire, some landscape need fire, but also fire can, without, without relationships, fire can become completely destructive. So it's not just, oh, the, the, the bad human is not understanding his relationship with the rest and is just uh, making havoc of the place. I feel like when we break relationship, when things are not in relationship or they are not acknowledging and honoring those relationships, they can all be destructive. We're just an expression of that, but fire is another good expression and water definitely can be also destructive. So I think, again, the key word is, how are you doing with your relationship? <laughs> and what kind of work are you putting into those relationships? And as I said, like, you know, I had after my operation recently, I had a lot of anger and I made a bit of havoc on my relationships. And now I had to go and uh, amend and nurture that again. And yeah because um, that was, uh, in a way, a, a part of me that was uh, believing not to be in relation. Mm. So, yeah, it's so interesting. The question is, like, I don't know what it's going to be <laughs> like looking at the relationship with fire or stones, but I'm open to the, to the exploration. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because both of those as you were saying, I, they're, they're very symbolic. I mean, water, water is often symbolized with, with death, with return, with the feminine, which is also something I think a lot of us have, you know, an inherent fear to, to some degree and the unknown, the, 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 what's beyond the mind. And, and then the fire is the opposite of that. It's more the masculine, the destruction, the death, the, 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 the killing, which is also something we're all very afraid of. And you know, it seems all of these things, in, in a way, they're symbolic of, of death and the return, which, you know, you also mentioned this idea, which a lot of, I think, people experience when they begin to have a relationship with plants is, again, this sense of coming home, you know, but, but that really requires going into the fire, go, going into, dying. you know, the, the depth <laughs> of the water, that, that dying experience. So... Uh, yeah, I, I just that came to mind. It, it seems really fascinating. Maybe that you're you're drawn to that somehow. <laughs> mm. And also, I guess both elements are life giving, of course. Mm -hmm. So, so in a way, again, uh, you know, the plants might have to kill you first, metaphorically, <laughs> or uh, one aspect of you, uh, so that they can actually be life giving but really life-giving, like uh, bring you back to real life, 
rather than a life that is um, imagined into your head and and is so disconnected from what is actually happening. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so yeah and that that's another I, I think symbology of all of all of this work is is really it's mm -hmm. it's a process of death of dying so that mm -hmm. you can be reborn and it, you know it's really interesting with fire too because a lot of times i notice when people come to the jungle and and they see kind of this slash and burn there's this like you know almost like panic reaction like no that's death it's destroying but but actually it's life generating it, it's actually if you do it properly if you, if you do it with knowledge it gives life it regenerates it's life fine. and and it's and fine. i think that's where a lot of our disconnect comes from potentially is is we've we've lost that relationship we we look at these things as good or bad or you know there's only one way but we forget that there are these there's always these these two sides there's a deeper knowledge to all of these things and i think that's really beautiful what you're doing too is is really trying to explore these things to to shed to shed light on them hmm. and i guess um you know i just feel like uh, i've died so many times <laughs> in this process that um yeah it kind of feel like well what can another death do you know, <laughs> what can another one do? And uh, and knowing that no matter how uh, debilitating or destabilizing those uh, dying moments feel, um, certainly one thing that life has taught me is that um, life after those is so regenerated, just like on the land, just like everywhere else. It's like after a big fire that is being done properly, so that's why even this work with the plants, uh, yeah, it needs to be taken, you know, with care and it needs to be done properly. It's not just about like, yeah, just go for it. These plants are so potent, they will destroy you and then they will bring you to life. It's not like that. And actually the damage, like just like a fire out of control, the damage can be devastating. So you need to know that, um, you know there is a relationship and if you don't have a relationship yourself you need to be uh, with uh, in you know in the trust of someone that actually really does have a deep relationship with these plants and this work so that it is safe you know it is like a control burn it is safe and uh, it might look out of control but actually it's all fine and unfortunately, this is another issue that I guess um, a side effect of these um, plants becoming, especially, you know, the, the psychedelic plants becoming so popular in, uh, especially in the West, that the, the, the danger of misusing them, not just like uh, using them inappropriately, but in containers which are not safe, in, uh, uh, in, um, with, in contexts which are not appropriate, uh, yeah, the side effects could be devastating, like a fire out of control. And it's got nothing to do with the plants themselves, because then that's what we do. We criminalize the fire for causing all this havoc and the plant for causing all this damage. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe to wrap up, uh, do you have any do you have any um, thoughts on on kind of the the world situation? I mean, obviously we're, we're in a we're in a very trying time, um, but I you know also as you were speaking about with your work, you know the, these people who began to publish this work on plant sounds and they didn't accredit you. But as you said, kind of beautifully, I mean, that also shows that, that this, this way of looking at things is beginning to expand. And I think we see it in the world of plants, like it is becoming much more acceptable. Um, a friend sent me an article today of like, how to, how to promote this work on social media, you know, like, <laughs> which just seems so wild that, you know, we're actually even at the point where we're actually talking about that. And, um, you know, and and so, do you see do you see in your work that that this is becoming more kind of embodied, more accepted? Do you, do you see younger people who are interested in that, and a kind of like a, a hope that that this is beginning to to spread? Yeah, definitely. And uh, I receive a lot of requests from various young students who wants to you know know how to start this work and whatever and. Uh, 
and I apologize because uh, often I don't get to reply to all of them. I try, but <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and also like a few students have contacted me sharing their data and said, like, "Oh, I did this experiment and I found this, and and I can feel their excitement. I can also feel um, how they can see that it's like, uh, well, you know." It's almost like the old guard doesn't believe this, but I, I see it and I've done my own experiment and I can see it. And, you know, what I found is, uh, you know, it's really cool and I'm excited about this. And I think that ultimately from a scientific perspective is like uh, the reason why many people enter into science is not because uh, so then I can be a professor <laughs> or I want to teach, you know. No, most people want to do science, especially biological sciences, because they're curious and they love to know how things or nature works. That's why we go into science. We just like, oh, I just love animals or I just love plants. And so to be able to, um, to, to have the, the honor really to, to, to receive all of these um, encouragement from these younger people like saying like oh i really love this i want to do this i want to explore this i want to it just reminds me like yeah yeah this is why we do science and a science done from that perspective is a good science now i guess the the um, the job of uh, the ones that are already in the system is if they can is to actually guide this new generation in a space where they can actually do this new science instead of trying to coerce them to become the same that we had because um but i think that this is happening a lot more than it was even just 10 years ago and uh and yeah and in, a, in the wider context you know thanks to covid uh in the context of plants people have been turning to plants and nature like crazy and i think again it's uh, it's quite funny but also quite obvious it's like they are trying to go home and uh, and we know exactly where home is it's just that we were so busy that we didn't have the time to even question whether we were at home or not and now that we got so much time and we're stuck in our apartment the one thing that we really miss is home and it's not the, the comfort of the apartment, it's the, the bush outside, the forest, the ocean, the, the walk on the beach, the, the walk in a park. It doesn't even have to be anything idyllic. It can be just a walk in a small park, seeing birds, seeing insects doing their thing, seeing dogs running wild, like with their friends playing with the sticks. That's what we miss. And that I think is a, in a way is a good outcome of the COVID. And maybe, you know, we needed to to go through this um, this membrane to remember. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Well, is there anything else you'd like to address? <laughs> I, I think I have already spoken too much. So <laughs> no, yeah, it's thank it, you for yeah. the opportunity. Yeah, well, it's been beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, if anyone is interested in your work, uh, your your book is beautiful, The Spoke the Plant. And um, can they contact you if someone's interested in reaching out to you via your website? Or can they purchase your book yeah. via the website? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, um, just for those who might be interested, uh, I am uh, co-editing a, a, a new book. It's called The Mind of Plants. And, uh, and in this book, uh, there are something like, I think, 60 different contributors. And um, from all sorts of areas of the world, we have like uh, younger voices, older voices, poets and essayists, artists, and uh, some uh, characters, some contributors are well known uh, and others are emerging and not so well known, but uh, all of the contributions to me are really beautiful. We asked everyone to just pick a plant that spoke for them and engage with them and, and write about it. So the collection is of, um, the book itself and the collection emerges just like a, a plant would grow its own root system and leaves you know, in a very decentralized way. We didn't make a list of the plants that we want to represent. We just allow them, whatever plants needs to be there will be there. 
and some again like the characters they write about them some plants are very famous and other plants are like who <laughs> but uh and then some obvious plants one of which uh, for me there is a little bit like a sadness but i also understand because that's how it goes that's how it emerge like um, one of the plants that is uh, missing for me in the collection is the tobacco and uh someone was going to write about it and then they they changed their mind and and so suddenly nobody wrote about it and i feel like oh no but it's so important and yet his absence is actually still there like in his absence he's speaking a lot and um so so the collection is um we have already sent the final manuscript to the press uh, so it's going to be published uh, in September, October this year, and we are very excited because, yeah, I think it's going to be really beautiful. And it's one of these books that uh, you can basically open it wherever you like and read because the, the, each chapter is very short and it's, and it's a very personal, there's a very personal, intimate touch to all of the contributions. So you could read it just before you go to bed and you have a story for bedtime or a poem before you, you go to sleep. But the, the interesting thing that maybe uh, the listeners are interested in, we are organizing uh, a symposium. Uh, it's, uh, the idea is to bring together all of these contributors in conversation. And um, because often when, we, when, when you know, these collections are prepared and edited, uh, the contributors don't really know what else is in the, in the, in the book until the book is published. And instead, in the spirit of the book itself, uh, of relating, connecting, and um, yeah, the intersubjective subjectivity of the of the book, uh, we wanted to like bring these contributors together and uh, for them to share reflection of what maybe they've learned in the process of engaging in this way, or basically whatever they want to share that is relevant to them in that moment. And also then bring them in conversation in a way that again is very organic. So it's like uh, you know whoever is in your panel, you never met them before maybe, and the conversation will go where it needs to go. And uh, and I'm really looking forward to it because I think it's going to be very beautiful. And and one thing that we are hoping to do, hopefully, will work. <laughs> again, in the spirit of this. Uh, of the book, but also in general, on, in the spirit of uh, the diversity that is represented also in humanity. Um, you know, of course, the book is uh, is being it's going to be published by um, an English speaking press uh, from the US. But um, some of the contributions are um, from authors that live and speak languages that are not English. Uh, actually many of them and uh, including indigenous languages and uh, and so we are think, thinking of um, allowing contributors to use that the time that is allocated to them to speak in whatever language actually needs to express what they feel and that means that they might use their indigenous language or whatever portuguese the german whatever it is or they might use a mix of them or they might use silence. <laughs> the idea is like uh, when you're talking about connecting to the mind of the plants or anything else to the greater mind, uh, it doesn't really matter what language you use. So English doesn't have to be the language. And if anything is, uh, yeah, in a way we are attempting to be a bit subversive and like, you know, if you're comfortable with English, that's fine. But if you're comfortable in other languages, express yourself in whichever way it's really more true to who you are, because that's really what we want. And, and even if I don't understand your words, I will feel you. So moving people away from the mind that thinks to the mind that feels. And uh, we'll see, you know, but everybody, of course, is invited. It's going to be free. So uh, everybody is invited to, you know, attend, participate, whatever, whatever. We're still in the, in the process of cooking it all up. So um, that's also something that uh, might be of interest. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would love to, to partake in that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I, I, I read your book and I, I found it really beautiful. Uh, you know, you, you, you spoke very 
very beautifully, I think, about the, the, the work you do about plants and these ideas of gratitude and humility. And I think these really important things about, you, you know, you, even you mentioned the, the story and how important the story is. And then also, you know, even letting that go. And I think that's so symbolic of, of, of not just plant work, but so many things in general. And um, and I, I really admire your your courage. I, I know it's a it's a very difficult place to be in when you're trying to kind of bridge these two seemingly separate worlds, which really at the end are the same thing. Uh, but you know, right. so many of us were so attached to one way of, of of looking at things or doing things, and I think it's such important work. And, and you know, I, I think you're you're one of the people who's who's really doing that beautifully. And I I think there's a lot of people out there who are really trying to do that. And I. I have a lot of hope for the future. So I, I really respect you and thank you for coming on. And I, you know, I hope some people buy that book and, and I wish you all the best. And I hope your work continues to, to grow and to flourish. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, I really hope the next time that we are able to travel and I find myself in that direction, I can come and visit and we can have that cup of tea in person. <laughs> That'd be beautiful, yeah. <laughs> well, thank right. you so much, Monica. <laughs> Thank you so much to you. And uh, yeah, I will see you soon. Yes, great. <laughs> All right, everybody, that is it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Monica Galliano. Um, I, I really enjoy talking to her. I think she's a, an amazing person and doing really important work. And I think work that's really needed to be done to, to really help to, to, to shine light onto really just the universe we live in and, and how we think about intelligence and consciousness and living beings and and our relationship to the world and and other life forms uh, i think her her work is is really profound and really beautiful so um that's it for the show as always if you're able to help to support the show that's deeply appreciated patreon is a really good option um for a few dollars a month you can help to donate to support the show and in return you get back things like early access to episodes bonus materials uh q a things like that so uh, to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. If you're able to do that, thank you very much. I deeply appreciate that. Uh, also with PayPal, if um, if you're able to do direct donation, I very much appreciate that. And to the people who have done that, thank you very much. Um, oh, and then also... Um, Simply going on the YouTube page and subscribing to the show is also a really big help. That really helps to get the show out to a bigger audience. So subscribing to the show, you can turn on the little notification bell to let you know when new episodes are out and liking the video. And then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts and also subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a review. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the next order of my guests. I'm trying to juggle uh, a few different people and seeing how that will uh, sort itself out. Um, but as always, I hope to bring on some really interesting guests. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you all on the next episode. Thank mm -hmm. you.